Hi everyone, I'm sharing with you this lecture that I presented last uh, September 26 in, uh, during the 2018 annual PSRM convention. Abnormalities of the reproductive tract represent a significant concern or a clinical dilemma for most reproductive specialists as it has been suggested that their presence is associated with adverse reproductive outcomes. Now, whether or not their presence affects reproductive potential or IVF success is still considered by many as debatable, and the effectiveness of surgical correction is still questionable. And most experts believe that this surgical procedure should be reserved only for specific cases. Now, the purpose of this lecture is to evaluate existing published data or literature and provide you with up-to-date clinical findings and recommendations to the question, surgery prior to IVF, is it really necessary? Since we have limited time for this discussion, I limited the question only for these six clinical situations. Let us first discuss endometriomas or endometriotic cysts. It is estimated that 6 to 10 percent of women, mainly of reproductive age, are affected by this condition, with a reported higher prevalence in certain subgroups such as those affected by infertility. Ovarian endometriomas can be found in up to 17 to 44 percent of women with endometriosis and are often associated with a severe form of the disease. The presence of an endometrioma can often present a clinical dilemma during the course of fertility treatment. Now, for example, there can be uncertainty regarding the decision to operate or to manage conservatively, balancing the potential detrimental effect of surgery on the ovarian reserve against the potential benefit that may be gained. The exact pathophysiology of endometrioma related to infertility is still unknown, but it can be detrimental to fertility directly by distorting tubo-ovarian anatomy or indirectly by invoking chronic inflammation and oxidative damage on the oocytes resulting in poorer quality oocytes. Surgical treatment of endometriosis and endometrioma prior to IVF or XC is widely practiced even though very little evidence exists to provide robust guidance to clinicians. More recent studies have generated some concern that the surgical treatment on endometrioma could be detrimental to ovarian reserve and subsequently adverse, adversely affect IVF ICSI reproductive outcomes. The possible adverse outcomes associated with the presence of endometrioma during IVF ICSI has not been widely studied. The risks of surgery and its potential damage to ovarian reserve has to be balanced with the complications associated with the persistence of the endometrioma during IVF ICSI. As such, this area of management often poses a clinical conundrum for healthcare practitioners. While the options include expectant and surgical management, the recommended treatment should be guided by the following factors. The woman's symptoms, fertility prognostic factors including the age in ovarian reserve, previous treatment history with specific reference to past surgical interventions, nature of the cyst, and of course the wishes of the woman. Let us now take a look at some of the published studies or data regarding the association of endometrioma with infertility and IVF ICSI outcomes. Now, this is a meta-analysis of 33 studies which reviewed the impact of endometrioma and IVF ICSI outcomes as well as the impact of surgery for endometrioma on IVF ICSI outcomes. Now, when compared with women with no endometriosis, Women with intact endometrioma had a similar live birth rate and uh, similar clinical pregnancy rates and similar miscarriage rates. But this group had higher cancellation rates, higher FSH levels, and lower number of mature oocytes retrieved. Now, how about the impact of surgical intervention of endometrioma on IVF ICSI outcomes? In women with endometrioma, those who had surgical treatment prior to IVF ICSI had a similar live birth rate and a similar clinical pregnancy rate and similar miscarriage rates and cancellation rates. However, 
women with endometrioma who had surgical treatment had lower antral follicle count and thus required a higher dose of FSH. Now, based on the available evidence, the Escher Guideline Group concluded that the cystectomy for an endometrioma larger than 3 cm prior to undergoing IVF treatment does not improve pregnancy rates at all. However, surgery prior to ART can be considered for the management of endometriosis-associated pain, for increasing the accessibility of the follicles during oocyte retrieval procedures, or to ameliorate any concern for malignancy. The Escher Guideline Group also advises us to counsel these women about the risk of reduced ovarian function following surgery and that the decision to proceed with surgery for an endometrioma should be carefully considered using the following factors. Now, we all know that any type of surgery could cause additional damage to the already compromised ovarian function of a, a patient with an endometrioma, even when the surgery is performed by a skillful gynecologic surgeon. Now, does this mean that um, aspiration or transvaginal guided aspiration of the endometrioma is a better alternative than cystectomy? Well, it seems so when you look at the results of this Cochrane meta-analysis. Now, it says here that the uh, aspiration was associated with greater number of mature oocytes retrieved and increased ovarian response compared to expectant management, and that aspiration versus cystectomy showed no evidence of a difference in terms of clinical pregnancy rates or the number of mature oocytes retrieved. However, Transvaginal ultrasound guided aspiration, although it may seem to be a safe and effective procedure, it has a very high recurrence rate after aspiration, and is and this recurrence rate is uh, found to be really very unacceptably high. There is convincing evidence that responsiveness to gonadotropins. This is um, an opinion article made by Ho Professor Juan A. Garcia Velasco, and he concurs or completely agrees with the findings of previous studies that indeed laparoscopic surgical removal of endometriotic cyst prior to IVF does not offer any additional benefit in terms of fertility outcomes. And he also recommends proceeding directly to IVF to reduce time to pregnancy to avoid potential surgical complications and to limit patients' cost. Now, he also advises surgery, but surgery should all, only be reserved for specific cases such as treating concomitant uh, severe pain symptoms or when malignancy cannot be reliably ruled out or in the presence of very large cysts. Here are some of the clinical variables to be considered when deciding whether or not to perform surgery in women with endometriosis. Um, selected for IVF. Now, if the patient has at least one surgical intervention for an endometrioma or her ovarian reserve is already low and uh, she has um, bilateral endometriomas, then this favors expectant management. However, on the other side of the coin, if the patient has severe pain symptoms, if she has sonographic feature of malignancy, or if the cysts demonstrate rapid growth, then these factors favor surgery. Let us now tackle hydrosalpinks. It is now recognized that the live birth rate of patients with hydrosalpinges undergoing IVF is only less than half than that of women who do not have hydrosalpinges, and that the adverse impact of hydrosalpinges on implantation may be attributed to direct embryotoxic effect, mechanical or flushing effect on the embryo, and a negative effect on endometrial receptivity.
Saltangectomy before embryo transfer has been shown to improve endometrial receptivity. Studies have also reported enhanced ovarian response and increased pregnancy rates following salpingectomy. Now, a prophylactic salpingectomy prior to IVF is usually done to eliminate possible tubal inflammation and toxins that might harm the embryo. Now, salpingectomy has certain surgical risks, particularly in patients with history of abdominal surgery or in patients with severe abdominal or intra-abdominal adhesions. And also, more and more experts believe that because of the transection of collateral vessels in salpingectomy, ovarian blood flow may be reduced, possibly leading to a poor ovarian response to IVF hormone stimulation. Now, at this point, we would like to look at the evidence for other alternatives to salpingectomy, namely proximal tubal occlusion and transvaginal ultrasound-guided aspiration of the hydrosal pinks. Now, this here is a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials comparing salpingectomy and proximal tubal occlusion for hydrosal pinks prior to in vitro fertilization. And what, is, what are the results? Uh, based on this forest plot, we see that there's no significant difference in terms of the number of oocytes retrieved, the number of embryos transferred, and the number of fertilized oocytes. Also, there's no significant difference in terms of clinical pregnancy rates and implantation rates. Now, how about ultrasound-guided aspiration of hydrosalpings versus salpingectomy? We see here a randomized control trial that placed these two operative procedures head-to-head. -head. So, there's no significant difference in terms of FSH dose, number of follicles, retrieved oocytes, metaphase oocytes, fertilization rate, and the number of embryos transferred. There's also no significant difference in terms of clinical pregnancy rates, ongoing pregnancy rates, and implantation rates. However, the biggest disadvantage of ultrasound-guided aspiration is the rapid reaccumulation of the hydrosalpings fluid, which in this RCT happened in about 34.21% of, of patients who underwent aspiration, which we know has a negative impact on implantation and pregnancy rates. So let's take a look at the data. So we see here that there is significantly lower implantation rate, lower clinical pregnancy rates, and lower ongoing pregnancy rates for patients who had reaccumulation of hydrosalpings fluid as compared to those patients who underwent salpingectomy. Now, there are conflicting reports on whether or not salpingectomy compromises ovarian response to stimulation during IVF treatment. Now, whether or not that's true, it is prudent that when carrying out salpingectomy, to just to diathermize and incise as close to the fallopian tube as possible and as far away from the ovary as possible to avoid disruption to the ovarian blood supply. And thankfully, um, a very new very newly published um, observational study showed that salpingectomy has no short-term effect on serum AMH levels. We now go to endometrial polyps. Polyps are common among women with unexplained infertility and repeated impl implantation failure following IVF. Now, for asymptomatic women undergoing IVF, the prevalence of endometrial polyps, as determined by hysteroscopy, is around 6 to 8 percent. The detrimental effects of polyp on fertility remains incompletely understood, but it is theorized that it could be secondary to a mechanical obstruction of the ostium such that the sperm or the embryo transport is hindered. And it could also be secondary to inflammatory changes or altered endometrial receptivity. Hysteroscopic polypectomy is generally recommended to restore normal anatomy prior to fertility treatments. There is actually sufficient data to support hysteroscopy if a polyp is discovered incidentally or otherwise. Hysteroscopy 
should be strongly considered after a failed IVF cycle and in the setting of recurrent implantation failure. Perhaps the best evidence for polyps as a cause of infertility comes from a well-designed RCT of 215 infertile women with polyps planning to undergo IUI. Now we see here that there is a significantly higher pregnancy rates in women who had hysteroscopic polypectomy compared with diagnostic hysteroscopy or with just polyp biopsy. Now, how about the evidence for hysteroscopy after a failed IVF? Actually, there are two meta-analyses on hysteroscopy after a failed IVF prior to another IVF cycle, and one of those meta-analyses is this one. And we see here a 1.7-fold increase in clinical pregnancy rate following hysteroscopy and resection of lesions if found. Based on this meta-analysis of five RCTs, there appears to be a modest benefit of routine hysteroscopy prior to IVF in terms of clinical pregnancy rates. In a very recent RCT looking at the use of routine hysteroscopy prior to IVF ICSI, um, this study concluded that routine office hysteroscopy is an essential step for infertility workup before IVF ICSI, even in patients with normal transvaginal ultrasound. Now let us go to uterine septum. One of the most common forms of congenital uterine malformations is the uterine septum, and the incidence has been reported to be as high as 3-4% to in the general female population, and this is significantly higher among patients with infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss. Uterine septum is usually associated with adverse obstetric outcomes and infertility. Now let's take a, uh, take a look at some of the data published on or about uterine septum. This is um, a retrospe retrospective match control study that evaluated the effect of septum on pregnancy rates after IVF. And it showed that uh, pregnancy rates prior to hysteroscopic metroplasty were significantly lower both in women with subseptate and septate uterus. But after surgery, the pregnancy rate was comparable to the pregnancy rate in women with a normal uterus. Also, we have a meta-analysis of comparative studies which showed that spontaneous abortion rates was increased in women with uterine septum. So based on this evidence that we have, the, the practice committee of the ASRM advises that in a patient with infertility, prior pregnancy loss or poor obstetrical outcome, it is reason reasonable to consider septum incision. However, in a patient without infertility or prior pregnancy loss, it may also be reasonable to consider septum incision following counseling regarding potential risk and benefits of the procedure. The fifth topic is leiomyoma uteri. Uterine leiomyomas can cause anatomical disruption of the uterine architecture and submucosal leiomyomas may actually impact the endometrial cavity, thereby possibly impacting embryo implantation and development. That's why it's, no, it's not really a big question whether or not to remove submucous myomas prior to IVF. It's really very important that we remove submucous myomas prior to IVF. Now, the real question now here, or the real dilemma here now is whether or not it is important to remove intramural myomas prior to IVF, especially the non-cavity distorting type. Intramural or subserosal leiomyomas may grow to large sizes prior to inducing symptoms of pelvic pressure or pain, and they could also potentially disrupt fertility and maintenance of pregnancy. Now, the impact of non-cavity distorting leiomyomas or the non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids remains controversial, but some studies have suggested an adverse effect on implantation and pregnancy rates for women undergoing IVF, particularly if the intramural fibroids are more than 4 centimeters. There are actually three meta-analyses that discussed uh, the impact of non-cavity distorting leiomyomas, and all three meta-analyses concluded that there is reduced implantation rates.
However, despite the claim that there is reduced implantation rates for uh, women undergoing IVF who have non-cavity distorting intramural myomas, still myomectomy did not appear to significantly increase the clinical pregnancy rates and live birth rates among these women. Now, this is a meta-analysis that um, studied the effect of intramural fibroids without uterine cavity involvement on the outcome of IVF treatment. And this meta-analysis concluded that the presence of non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes in women undergoing IVF treatment. So we see here a forest plot. Um, showing to us a decrease in uh, um, live birth rates among women with uh, non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids and also a decreased clinical pregnancy rates among these women. Now, this is the latest um, study on non-cavity distorting intramural fibroids and its impact on IVF. Now, this one showed results such as that the presence of non-cavity distorting fibroids negatively affects clinical pregnancy rates and live birth rates among patients undergoing IVF XC, and that the deleterious effects on live birth rates was significant among women with more than two intramural fibroids and fibroids that are more than three centimeters. Again, I am emphasizing that of the systematic reviews published most of these published con concluded that there is no sufficient evidence regarding the effect of removal of intramural myomas on reproductive outcomes of these infertile women. And thus, there is no consensus on whether or not intramural fibroids in women undergoing IVF should be removed, although many clinicians would recommend removal of intramural fibroids if they are more than 4 cm in diameter. Lastly, we discuss endometrial injury. Endometrial injury is the intentional damage the endometrium performed when the objective of improving the reproductive outcomes of women or couples desiring pregnancy. The most common intervention is endometrial scratching performed using a pipel. The underlying mechanism of how endometrial injury improves endometrial receptivity remains unclear. However, it is hypothesized that the mechanical effect of local injury to the proliferative endometrium induces endometrial decidualization, a process that naturally occurs in preparation for pregnancy and therefore favors implantation. Also, the injury induces a wound healing response, which involves recruitment of immune system cells to the site of healing. Also, endometrial injury retards endometrial maturation, leading to better synchronicity between the endometrium and the transferred embryo. So what is the data or the evidence on endometrial injury? This is a Cochrane meta-analysis that analyzed endometrial injury or the impact of endometrial injury in women undergoing IVF. And it shows here that endometrial injury was associated with an increase in live birth or ongoing pregnancy rates and also is associated with an increase in clinical pregnancy rates. So how about the timing? When, do, when is it best to, to do endometrial injury? It is found out or it is noted that endometrial injury done between day 7 of the previous cycle and day 7 of the embryo transfer cycle is associated with an increase in live birth or ongoing pregnancy rates and is also associated with an increase in so how about the timing of endometrial injury when is it when is the best time to do endometrial injury for these women? So it is found out through this meta-analysis that when endometrial injury is done between day 7 of the previous cycle and day 7 of the embryo transfer cycle, this is associated with an increase in live birth and ongoing pregnancy rates. Also, 
um, endometrial injury done between day 7 of the previous cycle and day 7 of the embryo transfer cycle is associated with increase in clinical pregnancy rates. However, when endometrial injury is done on the day of oocyte retrieval, this is associated with a decrease in live birth rates and a decrease, a decrease in clinical pregnancy rates. So the authors concluded that endometrial injury performed between day 7 of the previous cycle and day 7 of the embryo transfer cycle is associated with improvement in live birth and clinical pregnancy rates in women with more than two previous embryo transfers. Now, endometrial injury on the day of oocyte retrieval is associated with a reduction of clinical and ongoing pregnancy rates. Studies suggest that endometrial scratching should be carried out approximately 7 days prior to the onset of menstruation, immediately before the start of ovarian stimulation for IVF treatment, and that couples should be advised regarding the importance of protected intercourse in the month of the endometrial scratch. So, we come to the summary of recommendations for each of the clinical situations that we have discussed. So, first, for endometrioma, Laparoscopic surgical removal of ovarian endometriomas prior to IVF does not offer any additional benefit in terms of fertility outcomes. However, surgery prior to IVF can be considered for management of endometriosis-associated pain, increasing the accessibility of the follicles during OPU, and to ameliorate any concern for malignancy. It is recommended to proceed directly to IVF to reduce time to pregnancy, to avoid potential surgical complications, and to limit patient cost. For hydrosalpinx, salpingectomy prior to embryo transfer has been shown to improve endometrial receptivity. For endometrial polyps, hysteroscopy should be considered before IVF and is highly recommended after one otherwise unexplained failed IVF cycle in the setting of recurrent implantation failure. For septum, hysteroscopic septum incision is associated with a reduction in subsequent miscarriage rates and improvement in live birth rates in women with a history of recurrent pregnancy loss. For intramural myoma uteri, while well, most studies suggest an adverse effect on implantation and pregnancy rates in women with intramural fibroids, there is insufficient evidence to conclude that myomectomy improves IVF outcomes. And lastly, for endometrial scratching, endometrial injury performed between day 7 of the previous cycle and day 7 of the embryo transfer cycle is associated with an improvement in live birth and clinical pregnancy rates in women. Thank you for watching and thank you for your kind attention.